Okay, this is our lecture on Parkinson's disease. And this will allow us to have definitely more time for some video clips, discussion about both medical and uh, therapy treatments for Parkinson's disease. So let's go through the pathology a little bit first. It does involve the basal ganglia. I think I mentioned that quite a bit when we were talking about coordination deficits. And with the basal ganglia, what we are basically looking at is we have difficulty, of course, initiating movement. Um, it causes the patient to have involuntary movements like tremors. Uh, posture definitely gets affected and muscle tone. And with muscle tone with Parkinson's, it's typically going to fall into that rigidity uh, type of, of abnormal tone that we've talked about. There are basically four classic signs of Parkinson's disease. Now, that doesn't mean that every patient is going to have all four of the classic signs all the time, but kind of the hallmark one that everybody thinks of with Parkinson's is going to be that tremor at rest. And that usually involves the thumb and the index finger, but definitely it can involve other fingers or even the wrist area. It's usually at a pretty fast clip of like four to seven tremors per second when it involves that thumb and that index finger. So uh, the unique thing about that type of tremor tremor is once the person goes to do a functional task with that upper extremity, the tremor has stopped. It, it just is occurring in a resting state. The second classic sign is going to be rigidity, and we know that that basically means we've got resistance to passive range of motion. Muscles are very rigid. They're almost in a state of contraction, even when the person is at rest. And basically, this is going to lead to a lot of those postural issues that we'll talk about, and it definitely leads to uh, possibility of contractures that patients can have as well. Two types of rigidity that we see would be the cogwheel or the lead pipe. Cogwheel is really jerky, kind of ratchet-like, so if you tried to straighten out someone's elbow who had a lot of rigidity in the upper extremity, for example, what you'd see is you would start to straighten out the elbow and then it would flex a little bit and then you would straighten it a little more and then it would flex a little bit. So kind of alternates between contraction and relaxation. Lead pipe is the other type, and that's going to be uh, just the opposite. There's just that normal, smooth, uniform resistance, no fluctuations at all. It, it's basically like trying to bend or straighten out a lead pipe. It's just that um, uniform with the resistance with no ratchiness or contraction relaxation alternating itself. That's probably going to be the more common type that you'll see in Parkinson's is the lead pipe. The next classic sign is going to be bradykinesia or akinesia. So looking at that terminology, it's either going to be just kind of a lack of the ability to initiate movement, or it's going to be movement that's really slow. That bradykinesia would be slow, slowness of movement. Um, these patients will sometimes have freezing where movement just stops altogether. Uh, but what you'll really see with bradykinesia and akinesia is that it will fluctuate a lot, maybe from time of the day, whether the patient isn't feeling well, just like tone fluctuates that way, um, you can have periods of time where they have more symptoms of that and then other periods of time where they don't. A lot of that is really medication dependent too. Then there's postural instability, and that can really be the loss of or delayed in our postural reflexes, our balance reactions. They typically begin to develop a very narrow base of support, flexed posture, posterior pelvic tilt, forward head, increased thoracic kyphosis. We'll see a little picture here coming up that, that will really show the postural deficits that you see in Parkinson's disease. And then some people will add a fifth uh, classic sign, and that would be the festinating gait. With festinating, we basically mean the speed starts to increase, but the actual stride length would begin to decrease. So they begin to have really short, shuffled steps. Many times um, when you say that with a Parkinson's patient, what's happening is the longer that they go, the faster they're attempting to go. But, of course, they're not really making any appreciable distances because that stride length is becoming um, so short, even sometimes like an inch or two for their step length. There's the posture. Um, definitely everything kind of moves forward. So it's pretty obvious that most of the time when these patients look up or if they have any kind of balance disturbances from the front side or a, a posterior balance disturbance, they're going to lose their balance backwards um, more easily than anything else. Studies would show that 10% um, of Parkinson's patients fall about once a week. So you can imagine all the comorbidities that occur because of that as far as soft tissue damage, 
hip fractures, things like that. Okay. To the cause of it, I already said it's basal ganglia, but there's a, a part of the basal ganglia known as the substantia nigra. And basically what's happening there is the dopamine neurotransmitter is degenerating. You're seeing depigmentation. And so we're seeing degeneration of those neurons that would produce that neurotransmitter. And so that neurotransmitter, dopamine, is what is actually responsible for initiating movement and kind of getting the ball rolling for uh, muscle contraction to occur. So that makes sense that what we see is that delay or that absence of movement. There is somewhat of a genetic predisposition uh, with Parkinson's disease, but it's definitely not just something that's inherited. You may see it more in some families, but it's not one of those things that you can say, okay, mom or dad passes this on to their offspring or anything like that. The other thing that's that it's important to differentiate is the difference between Parkinson's disease and what we would call Parkinsonism. So there's a lot of different disorders that can produce abnormalities um, because of basal ganglia dysfunction. And these people will have symptoms that mimic those classic signs or any combination thereof, but they don't show that depigmentation of uh, the substantia nigra. They actually uh, don't have the Parkinson's disease as we know it. Parkinson's itself, even though we've said there is a little bit of a genetic predisposition, is considered to be of idiopathic etiology, that there is just not one thing that they can say, yes, this causes this person to have Parkinson's disease. Um, another type of that falls within that realm of Parkinsonism, but not really Parkinson's disease, is post-infectious Parkinsonism. And you don't see that too often anymore, but with some of the flu outbreaks in the early part of the 20th century that caused people to have encephalitis, many of those people developed Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's symptoms, I should say, um, but not actually Parkinson's disease. Once the flu was improved, if they survived the encephalitis, which back then not as many people did, uh, they were able to, to show a pretty much normalized function and return, um, but not necessarily in every case. Then there's toxic Parkinsonism, which is actually a, a poisoning or it would be exposure to certain um, chemicals, industrial waste like mercury, manganese, uh, carbon monoxide, methanol, etc. Pharmacologic Parkinsonism, certain types of drugs, especially neuroleptic drugs, antidepressants um, in high doses sometimes, and antihypertensive. And it's not that if someone is on one of those medications, they're going to develop Parkinson's, Parkinsonism type symptoms, but it could usually be a combination of several medications that can cause the person to begin to show bradykinesia or slowness of movement or develop that tremor. Metabolic Parkinsonism is caused by hypothyroid problems or parathyroid problems or problems in the body with calcium metabolism. It's pretty treatable as long as that is found out that that is the, the cause of it. And then if you have someone who is having some small strokes, TIAs, that affect the basal ganglia, it only makes sense that they're going to present with Parkinsonism. And in that case, it is considered arteriosclerotic Parkinsonism. Here's some numbers for you. Um, quite a few, 100 to 150 people out of every 100,000 in the population will develop Parkinson's disease. 1% are age uh, over 60. Um, it increases with age, as you'll see there, by the 2.6%. But about one out of every 10 are that young onset Parkinson's disease, and that would be diagnosed before the age of 40. Um, it's been my experience, and I haven't had a lot, lot of young Parkinson's patients, but those that I have had that are younger tend to be the ones who develop a lot more severity um, with some of their symptoms at, a, at an earlier stage when they develop it early. So um, they also tend to be more the type that get like the dystonias and the abnormal movements, more so than seeing uh, things like the tremor at rest and um, also showing the festinating gait. You don't, don't generally tend to see that as much in the younger populations with Parkinson's disease. Medical management. Uh, medications are super important in Parkinson's disease. And just like with any type of medication, after a while, you may just need to be on a little bit of a drug holiday, take a break, revamp, have the neurologist 
kind of redo what medications that you're on. But probably the one that you would recognize the most out of that list of three there would be Cinemet. Um, it's it's kind of considered the classic. It's been developed and changed over the years, but most patients with Parkinson's disease are on Cinemet or some form of it. Um, you could also look at things like deep brain stimulation, um, actually stem cell implants in the basal ganglia, and then surgical intervention. And rather than talk about that now, we'll watch a couple uh, video clips that kind of talk about some new, um, new and, and evolving medical treatments that are on the horizon for Parkinson's. So here's where we get involved a little bit more because here would be the physical symptoms and the clinical things that we see, uh, which really warrants that PT has to get involved in seeing these patients. So when patients begin to have difficulty with their basic activities of daily living, just getting in and out of bed or chairs, um, being able to write, sign their name, getting dressed, cutting up food, just all of the basic stuff that we have to do from a day-to-day -day basis, um, when that becomes affected, we definitely need some intervention. Rigidity, um, we all know what things that can cause as far as decreased range of motion, poor posture. Um, it can begin to affect the facial muscles, the chewing, the swallowing muscles, which will make it very difficult for patients to eat, um, keep food in their mouth, be able to swallow appropriately. You may have uh, difficulty with that, or you'll see patients that have a little bit excessive drooling because they just can't um, keep up with, with the amount of movement that's needed in the facial and the jaw and the swallowing muscles and things like that. Um, you'll definitely see the tremor. Um, it can usually be pretty well controlled on medication, but hand tremor and that pin rolling that I talked about are the most common, but you can see the tremors in other places and you can even develop a postural tremor with Parkinson's disease. Speech will usually also see Parkinson's patients for decreased breath support um, because those patients tend to have those postural issues. What happens to their uh, voice is that it begins to become very monotone. It's very soft. Um, it's very difficult for them to get the, to get the words out sometimes um, in a manner that they can carry on a conversation or they're talking at such um, a low volume that it's difficult for people to hear. And so we're gonna talk a little bit um, in class about the big and loud program. Uh, the big program is more the physical therapy aspect of treating Parkinson's disease and the loud program is the speech pathologist uh, way of treating Parkinson's disease. Uh, the rigidity can affect facial muscles. So what you might see with uh, Parkinson's patients is they have almost what we would call a mask face. They don't drink, or, I'm sorry, they don't blink um, as often as what normal people would blink or people without Parkinson's would blink. They kind of have a lack of expression on their face. Um, and again, it's, it's just due to rigidity and muscle tone that's affecting those facial muscles. Postural problems, I think I've already talked about that. Your biggest thing that becomes limited with patients with Parkinson's, and it has a lot to do with that rigidity of the trunk, is that they lose rotation. So you'll see gait that has almost no upper rotation, lower trunk rotation, obviously no counter rotation. When we did our PNF unit, we did a lot of nice rotational things, both in sitting hook lying, uh, counter rotation that just really can help with that rigidity and help with those patients to, to get that movement back. Uh, the postural issues and the rigidity can start contributing to some kind of spinal pain, whether it's low back, neck pain. Balance problems occur. Those strategies are very delayed. Um, the posture itself, as it is worsening over time, it's going to make balance worsen over time as well. And then coordination problems make sense uh, with the area, with the basal ganglia also be affected, and with the rigidity that they're going to have a lot of difficulty even with reciprocal movements of the upper extremities and the lower extremities. Commonly, what we see for gait deviations for Parkinson's disease are going to be really shortened stride length. Um, steps become very shuffled. Foot doesn't even come up off the ground. You'll get foot flat at initial contact. No heel contact um, as the first part of gait. Step height obviously is affected then too, so it's just like they're shuffling along the floor. Um, that makes ambulating on carpeted surfaces a lot more difficult for these patients as well. You won't see a whole lot of arm swing. Um, that has to do with that reciprocal movement. 
uh, when we add a walker into the mix, that obviously takes away the arm swing as well. What you'll a lot of times see with those Parkinson's patients is that when they turn, this is when they get into a lot of trouble. You could have a patient that's tooling along pretty nicely in a straight uh, path down the hallway, and then you need them to take a left-hand turn. And this is where sometimes the freezing of movement will occur as soon as they've got to turn that corner. So actually turning around, backing up, is usually very difficult for Parkinson's patients as well. If they do get that festinating gait, which we talked about, the stride and the um, step length is shortening and they're shuffling, but they're trying, they're almost getting faster and faster, you really see stopping a lot more difficult for these patients. And so sometimes your typical front wheeled walker or four wheeled walker just does not cut it very well when it comes to these patients. And we're going to talk about um, some other types of assistive devices uh, like the U-Step or laser walkers. And I've actually got a picture of that um, in your handout for you that really can work nicely with patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, we'll also see where they may accelerate. And, and I talked about festination, but we can actually have that both in a forward direction or in a backwards direction. So they go to start to back up, for example, to the chair, and they begin to go a little bit faster. Acceleration increases, and they almost fall backwards into a chair. Or if it's forward, that's where you'll see, you know, the walker is three feet ahead of them, and it's difficult for them to stay inside the walker because propulsion is pulling, you know, their, their upper body forward too much, and their legs just aren't keeping up with it with the, the slow and shuffled gait that they have going on. So the laser walkers are actually kind of designed to help the patient have that visual and that proprioceptive input as to where they need to be in relation to their walker. So we'll talk about that as well. There's just a simple example of visual cueing. Maybe you want floor markers, how far that step length can be. That is really the premise of the BIG program that we'll talk about and we'll watch a couple video clips on. Um, everything needs to be big movements and that's, that's the whole idea with it and providing those visual or proprioceptive cues for Parkinson's patients is, is really, really helpful. Okay, I already talked about festinating. And fascinating, you know, what the hallmark of that is, yes, the speed, the acceleration is increasing, but what's happening when it's fascinating is that the stride length is shortening. That's different than when we said retropulsion or propulsion. Um, with the postural issues, we start seeing decreased extension at the hips, knees, ankles. Basically, everything is kind of becoming flexed forward. So eventually, if hip flexors tighten up, then we got hamstrings tightening up, and then we have a patient that doesn't even get full knee or hip extension when they're standing up. Decreased speed for sure, already talked about that, and then the heel-toe progression is obvious. If you're, if you're shuffling and you're coming in foot flat, you don't have any heel-to-toe heel progression during the gait cycle. Indirectly, we'll see that patients fatigue pretty easily with Parkinson's disease. We'll see that the flexibility is decreased. We'll see they, they can sometimes develop contractures. They're usually very stiff in the mornings um, if they've been laying in one position for a while, sleeping at night and that type of thing. Blurred vision comes about in some of your patients, but not all of them. And then about a third of your Parkinson's patients will actually develop what we would say is Parkinson's dementia, um, where they begin to get cognitive behavioral changes and sometimes a lot of symptoms of depression as well. Autonomically, the disease affects uh, things like your ability to sweat, um, your ability to produce saliva, you'll either have one extreme or the other, patients that produce too much saliva and can't control it um, because of the mask face and things like that, or you might have patients who have very, very dry mouths, which can be a side effect of the medication as well. Heat and cold regulation, everybody else in the room is hot, they may be freezing cold. Um, or vice versa. They may have difficulty because of the rigidity in um, some of their muscles of the bladder area that they may have dysfunction that way. Constipation can be a really big issue because again, as if they become less active and then you combine medications um, and the muscle rigidity, constipation can be a big issue for these patients. Um, in my experience, once you get them moving better again, that usually helps clear up some of the constipation issues that patients are having. 
cardiac wise, uh, they do tend to have more of a tendency to develop uh, low blood pressure orthostatically. So you really have to watch because their resting blood pressure might be pretty low. Um, they already might have some pulmonary impairments due to the impaired posture. Maybe they already have a history of COPD or things like that. So blood pressure is something that we do need to monitor sometimes because you'll get a patient who might get up, they start walking, and then all of a sudden they feel very lightheaded and ready to kind of pass out. Um, the simplest thing, if you've got somebody with orthostatic hypotension and you still want to get them up and mobilize them, try an abdominal binder or TED hose or both. Um, that will help with blood return, prevent pooling, and it really does help keep that blood pressure in check so that you don't have it going so low when you get to that upright position. Okay, um, then that concludes this lecture, and what we're going to do then in class is we will go through some treatment ideas, we will do some lab, and we'll definitely watch some good um, patient videos where we can see the results of the Big and Loud program as well as uh, some of the other great things that is being done on the horizon for Parkinson's disease. You should have a handout too that gives you some um, links to those uh, different clips that we're going to watch. Um, I especially like that one that's the cycling, the bicycling program for freezing gait and Parkinson's. It just really shows you how amazing um, things can, can actually um, be figured out in order to help these patients. So with that, I will conclude. Have a great day, guys. Bye.